we had similar things in the air where we had the iPads and they had all the maps of everything in the entire AO. And uh, there's definitely times where I've, you know, set my iPad on the floor, gone and started doing something. The, tile, the pilot takes a hard bank and I see that thing skipping, going out towards the end of the door and I just dive on it like it's a fumble and I'm in the Super Bowl, you know, like can't let that get out of there. Um, <clears throat> That's an NJP. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I, I actually, the, the unit that replaced us, one of them actually dropped an iPad out at one point in their deployment. They had to change, like, every single person in the entire AO had to change their stuff. Like, they, it changed everything. Like, <laughs> it was a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think a lot of that's the, you know, um, for us, it's, there's a big disconnect between um, the actual war, the way it's being carried out, like all the important steps, things that are happening behind the scenes and us actually just going and doing our jobs. Like we're trained to go out and we're trained to go do very specific things very well. And that's, that's all our world is. And then people introduce all this other stuff. And I, I think it's sometimes hard to grasp the, um, the weight of it or the severity of, you know, <laughs> of it all um, and why the systems are designed they are the way they are. And, and that, that's definitely a great example that the radio comms and, um, it, you know, you, we may just think like, oh, it's, you know, not that big a deal, but from a tactical perspective, it's a huge deal. If they were able to get a hold of it somehow, that'd be a huge deal. And then they'd be doing what we do to them, which is listening to every single thing they say. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so can you describe a time where um, you, ha you think you had your closest call? It was actually on a resupply. Um, no, we weren't under fire at all. Like, uh, we, we were doing a resupply for the, there were these snipers and they were on a ridge line and the ridge line was probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe four feet wide. And then on either side was, you know, several thousand foot drop. And they were on this, like this mountain ridge line and, um, they had been there for a few days. So we were there to resupply them with, uh, like water ammunition, like all the kind of things they would need. What part of it was this near the, uh, Pakistani border? Uh, no, this one was actually near, um, I don't know if you know where Lashkar guys at all. But it was it was some near it was it was kind of near there, and um, so we we'd gone out and we came into about a 15 foot hover, and we were throwing out a bunch of bunch of stuff, and some wind gusts kind of came and knocked us off course. So we came and we, we we turned around, we came back around, and this time we were at about 25 feet for some reason, and uh, so we were about 25 feet just throwing stuff off and watching them land, and then um, a gust of wind came out, and uh, well the way a helicopter flies is it uses its rotors to beat down the air. Like it physically just beats the air down. Um, so what had happened is a wind gust came and it blew all, of, all of the air out from under us and stopped. And so we had a bunch of dead air. And so we had nothing for our rotors to actually beat down. And so we, we were about 25 feet up. And in one second, you, could, you just felt like you dropped on some kind of ride at like Great America or Disneyland. Like instantly, you were just, we just dropped like 20, 25 feet, but almost hit the edge. I just started screaming, power, power, power. Um, my headset ended up getting ripped out from my um, helmet. Uh, we, we had ripped off a, a wing door, like one of the small doors of the helicopter, um, in order to get the, the supplies out quickly. And that door like came flying out of the aircraft. I had to jump out and grab it one-handed. And I was hanging on to like the mount for the weapon to stay in the aircraft. Like, and I, when I looked out, we were probably, I think our blades were maybe a foot away from the mountainside. So, um, if, if those blades would have dropped another foot or so, like we would drop like one more foot, we would have crashed off the side of the mountain and just rolled down thousands of feet. Uh, and so we, we had, the pilots ended up pulling power hard enough where we didn't actually crash. And so we, we started to fly away and we still had excess supplies and, um, we had a bunch of, uh, like warnings cause we had. Uh, like oversped the aircraft, over torqued the aircraft, done all kinds of things. And so that, that was a situation where I was the person on board who made the call of whether the mission continued or not, even though I was an E3 at the time and there was an E6 and then two O fours in the front. Um, like I, I, I was the one who knew the most about the aircraft and knew the most about the codes. I knew, um, and I knew we were able to continue the mission mission. So we ended up finishing out the mission. Uh, we dropped off all the supplies and we got back to base. It was probably about 30 minutes from the time we'd pulled power until we landed. And um, when we got back to base, my hands were still shaking. I looked at my other crew chief. His hands were still shaking. The pilot's hands were shaking. Like every, there was just adrenaline just pumping through us. And that was one of those, like, we should have died there moments. Um, everybody, you know, thinks the biggest enemy is like gunfire or RPGs or whatever it may be. But like the biggest enemy out there is gravity, at least for us. Wow. So, I mean, that's really scary because it, 
when I think when I imagine you guys on a ridge line, I imagine two different completely different weather and wind patterns on each side of the mountain, and they're both doing different things. And <laughs> if you're in the middle of that, yeah, like it's <laughs> it must be really difficult to fly in that in those conditions. It is, and and I'd seen it before because we, we do a lot of training in you know in mountainous areas just outside uh, Camp Pendleton, Southern California. They they have a lot of real real rocky rough terrain, and so I'd been battered around by the wind before, but uh, I'd I'd never I'd never experienced anything like that. Like I've I just been bounced around, maybe drop five feet and get thrown left and right, but uh, just completely dropping instantly at like twenty five feet was it's something I hadn't experienced and. Um, it was just all instinct. That's the only reason we were alive is everybody had their instincts kick in and it kept us from dying. So you mentioned that you were, you reached out, you grabbed this, this small door. Were you strapped in at all? Uh, yeah. So we, we have, we have a gunner's belt that's called, uh, connected to us. It's basically like, um, a big strap that goes across your chest and, uh, you can, you can pop it off with a little metal hook. And then you, you, you tie that, you, stra- you um, hook that strap into like little rings on the aircraft. And it's designed where if you fall out of the aircraft, it'll keep you from falling all the way out. Um, I wouldn't necessarily rely on that. I don't know if it would, would catch you or not. Um, it's supposed to, but the way I always envisioned it was if we were going, say, you know, 100, 120 miles an hour in an aircraft and I fell out for some reason, I'd end up just getting slapped against the side of the aircraft until I died. <laughs> so we just kind of expected that we were never going to rely on it, but it was on just to give us a warm and fuzzy, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> That's intense. Yeah. That's really intense. Um, so uh, when we were at the bar the other day, you were talking about the relationship you had with your crew. Um, it seems very different than relationships that larger Marine Corps units have. W- would you agree with that? Absolutely. And, I think that that has something to do with the uh, the approach, the mental approach. Um, in the normal Marine Corps everyday structure, it's extremely important that uh, rank and experience takes priority over everything. Um, so, you know, somebody of a higher rank tells you to do something, you shut the fuck up and you go do it. Like, you just go do what you're told um, because that's just the way it operates. And if everybody's doing what they're told all the time, then generally you have a really well-functioning machine. Yeah, there, there'll be instances here and there where that's not true, but, but overall, it, it, you know, it creates cohesion that's really needed in order for the Marine Corps to function. <clears throat> when you're an actual aircraft, um, any little thing that you do wrong can kill your entire crew. And if you're flying with another helicopter, it can kill both crews. So um, it changes the dynamic a lot. And, and because pilots and um, air crew focus on different things, pilots are purely focused on flying, where air crews focus more on the mechanical aspects and what's happening to the sides and behind, um, we, have different, we have different sets of responsibilities. So if I was, as an E3, was to speak up and say, uh, you know, instantly, hey, break left, break left, the pilots wouldn't question. They would just do what I told them instantly, follow through with exactly what my instructions were until I told them it was okay, and then they would ask me what was going on. And um, you need to be able to have those kind of relationships where there's no – no crazy power dynamics or anything like that in there. Everybody's equal in the aircraft because somebody, the lowest ranking member of your crew may see something that'll save everybody's lives. And so um, all the pride and the rank and all that stuff kind of goes out the window uh, whenever you're just trying to get things done. Mm-hmm. And so um, I remember from our conversation that you, um, you joined the Marine Corps and you had a pretty good ASVAB, right? So you were able to... Uh, get a, a pretty decent position and you wanted to do something like this, right? You wanted to, yeah, I guess a gunslinger. Yeah. I, I, I got a 94 on the ASVAB, um, which is pretty good. And, um, I, I had a whole range of jobs open to me. I, I knew I wanted to be involved. I actually wanted to see war. I wanted to be able to speak to that because it was something that kind of, I think defined our generation. And, um, so, so yeah, I wanted, I wanted to be involved in something, but I didn't want to feel like I was just, um, I don't know, just, just another normal cog. So uh, I had the opportunity because my recruiters liked me a lot and I may or may not have helped them out with a bar tab one night um, to, to get in to, to a great job with air crew. And uh, I just, I jumped at the, I jumped at it. And then um, whenever it came down to selection, cause this was just a, a general air crew designation. Um, when you actually go to, to school for training, then they assigned you which aircraft you're on. And I just, I got lucky that um, 
somebody liked me whenever we got to that process and I got to choose Hueys, which are, you know, attack aircraft as opposed to more cargo focused aircraft where you're basically just transporting people and things instead of actually going out to fight. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you mentioned, I remember in, in, in the story that I, that I first wrote, uh, Fraternity of Death, is that what you called it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, uh, the, the generation had, uh, you felt like people were going to war, that your generation was doing something, and that uh, you felt like you didn't want to let this, this pass without you being involved. Can you talk about that a little bit? So I, I graduated high school, and um, I was going to college for electron microscopy, um, which was, you know, obviously extremely boring lab work. Um, it was, it was something I wasn't that into. And I was, uh, you know, I watched nine 11 as a kid happen and I, I saw the war getting prosecuted and, you know, I, I saw people coming back under flags. I saw people going out and doing work. I was watching the YouTube videos of people in combat and I just, I felt guilty. I felt like I wasn't, you know, carrying my part of the load for, for my generation, I wasn't being involved in the, um, you know, the, the war that was happening, the, the biggest thing that was happening that I could be, I could actively contribute to. Um, so I, I put it off for a long time because, you know, that's, that's a big deal. You're devoting several years of your life and you may or may not get killed. Um, but, but eventually I just, I had to do what I, what I knew was right or else I'd, uh, end up regretting it and looking down on myself for the rest of my life. So. Mm -hmm. and can you describe, um, like where you were when 9-11 happened? <clears throat> yeah, I was, I was at my house. Um, I was in, it was my first year of high school, actually my freshman year. And, um, I had heard on the radio that there was something going on with the twin towers in New York, but I didn't really know anything of it. And, uh, so whenever I showed up to school, it was a very somber mood. And, um, basically the administration said, Hey, you know, this, this happened, you know, a terrorist attack happened. This is a huge deal. Uh, we're going to let everybody go home for the day to kind of be with their families. And it still hadn't set in. And then I, I went over to my aunt's house and I, we turned on the TV and I was just, we were watching the burning uh, buildings. We were watching people jump out and like, I, I don't know, it left, it left an impression for me just as it did for, I'm sure, um, everybody our age and older. Uh, it, it, it became a, um, a real catalyst for, for, for change in my life. And, um, it, it made the world, the world a lot more real for me as a freshman than it had been previously. You know, you live your life as a bubble as a kid, growing in a bubble as a kid growing up. And this was one of the first things where it, you know, made you realize the world is a much bigger and more dangerous place than you may think. And at what point after that happened, did you realize that you could actually be involved in the war? <clears throat> I would say I was a, um, I was a senior in high school and, and the thoughts have been going through my head basically the entire year. Um, but my senior year of high school, I was, I had a four, one, two GPA. Uh, I was a captain of, you know, multiple sports teams. Like I, I, you know, I thought, Hey, I, you know, I can't go to the military, I have so many things lined up for me as far as college and what I want to do with my life. Um, I, I just need to go pursue those things, you know? And, uh, like, as I said before, eventually my, um, my, 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 my desires, you know, aligned with what the society expects of you were outweighed by, um, like my internal guilt for not being a part of what was happening. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Cause I feel similarly, like if I had never joined the Marine Corps, um, I would, I would regret it right yeah. now. I would kick myself in the butt, um, and always think, man, like what if I had gone, what, you know, what if I had joined, are you glad that you didn't make the other choice? Absolutely. And, and that's, that's kind of a, a funny dynamic I've noticed for pretty much all my Marine friends have gotten out is, um, they're extremely glad they did it, but they'd never reenlist. <laughs> it's like, it's like we all had this purpose in us that we knew we had to go do something and be a part of something bigger and, you know, really contribute to what we thought was important. Um, and, and if we didn't do that, we, we wouldn't be satisfied with who we were as people. But once we did that, <laughs> it was time to move on and, you know, get our lives back and be able to live them for our, for ourselves, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's like, okay, I did this never again. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, um, it, it it's important. Uh, I'm really glad I did it. The people I met in the, in the military, are my favorite people I've ever met in my life. Um, they're as close to me as my actual family is. And, um, you know, I just love them. I love the people I was with. I was, I love that I was able to do 
um, you know, fly around in a helicopter in my early 20s. Like, how cool is that? Uh, you know, as, as a young kid, being able to hang out and shoot a minigun out of a helicopter, like that's just super cool. And, um, you know, being able to fly around an aircraft and fly over uh, down the coast of Southern California in through L.A. and over the, um, you know, over Disneyland, and the Playboy Mansion, do all kinds of cool, crazy stuff. Like that was a great experience and I'm, I'm extremely glad I did it. But uh, my time was definitely coming to its end whenever I got out. Mm -hmm. I, I would run into him every now and then at the channel. <laughs> and every time I'd see him, and this is, I mean, while I'm doing all these, you know, missions, getting blown up and stuff, and I'd run into him and he'd be like, dude, we're about, <laughs> we're about to get blown up. Like we, we got, we were, we were in Al Assad in Iraq. It was a huge base. And I think we got mortared like twice when we were there, but it's such a big, big base that. You know, the mortars were like really far away, but just the sound of the explosions made him think like, like he'd be like, dude, a mortar could land on us right now. And he was just freaking out about it. Um, and, uh, so he never left the wire and we all, ended, he ended up obviously coming home safely. <laughs> and, uh, then, uh, I ran into him just completely randomly, like right as I'm getting out doing my med separation, I run into him at the Camp Pendleton hospital and. Um, he re-enlisted and he, <laughs> this guy's a mess. And then I found him on Facebook like a year ago and he just talks about how, how difficult it was for him in the Marine Corps. And, um, it's interesting cause uh, not to diminish his experience, but Marines really, or some pe people, uh, interpret their experiences very differently because it seems like his experience now knowing him on Facebook, in a way, it seems like it, it haunts him. Um, and then you have other Marines, like yourself, and uh, several Marines that I know that have done very different, had a very different experience in the Marine Corps, who speak about it very differently. Um, is there, I guess, a reason why you think that, for you, it's, it's easier to talk about things like that? Uh, you know, I, I think that might come down to, like, people's makeup before they join the military. Um <clears throat> We all come in as different people and uh, we all we all bring whatever attributes and weaknesses we have to the table. And um, I, I think a lot of us have actually been through some rough experiences in our you know previous lives and we've been in danger and we've 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 faced we faced death maybe in some way or another, you know, be it be it a dangerous situation or watching a friend or family member die at a younger age. And um, <clears throat> I, I think that allows you to be be comfortable with death. And I, th I think once you accept that it's a possibility and that you're okay with that possibility, it, it kind of removes that, that fear that's inside that kind of uh, really drives most people. And um, some people can go in and they, they've, they've never had that experience that's ripped away their fear of death, that's ripped away their fear of danger and, and uh, that anxiety and, you know, inside of them. And it's, it's a lot harder to adapt to those situations. And um, myself in particular, I came from kind of a, kind of a bad place in uh, Stockton, California. And I was able to, um, I don't know if able to, but I, I experienced a, a lot of um, like violence at a younger age just because of what the city was itself. And um, that allowed me to take a more relaxed approach to the violence I was facing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, once I was in Afghanistan in the Marine Corps. And, and as I said before, obviously, like the distance, the distance helps a lot. Being able to like you know fly fly through the air that that really does make a difference as opposed to being on the ground. Um, if you are okay with dying, like if you are okay with just crashing, you don't have to worry about IEDs or any of that. Um, so so I think I think that's a big factor. Is, you, you know people's makeups, uh, what jobs people end up in, and then who they're surrounded by in their units. Um, we had a we had an extremely um, supportive, very very tight group, and like. There were 30 of us originally, and only 20 of us could go to Afghanistan, uh, my particular job in my unit. So basically, the people who wanted to go, who were, you know, I don't know if bloodthirsty is the right word, but who wanted to go out and get in some action and actually get in the mix and really, you know, just the fighters, we ended up going. And um, so I, I think that made a big difference. Um, I, I've definitely, you know, saw some of the people in support jobs that they've, They've, they've struggled with adjustments and they they never left the base um but they we our base was also attacked one night and um that comes with changing expectations if if you're expecting to be safe and then you're ripped out of that safety by something um be it going out on a on a convoy whenever you didn't you weren't really mentally ready for it 
or you know you were working your normal job for four months on base not seeing seeing any action and then 15 dudes come and there's rounds flying over your head um i think it can be a a, a real shock to somebody's psyche and if they if they've never experienced it and they don't know how to deal with it i think that can take them down some pretty negative roads and that's why you might see people who not weren't necessarily involved in a lot of action have some still have some difficulties is because they're going through something that you may have went through when you were 15, you know, and they're going through it now in a, in a different context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I really like what you said earlier uh, about um, accepting death. Because I feel like uh, a lot of people who go to a war zone expect it. Um, they might even want it or they might be in a position where you know, they see so many people die, they're like, well, I'm next. Um, and I won't be surprised if it happens to me. And so it's interesting because a lot of people that come back from war, most people that come back from war um, might have accepted death. And now they're like, oh, well, how do I live my life now? Um, I, I didn't plan to live uh, this long. I've spoken to some Marines who are like, you know, um, I didn't expect to live to the age of 25. And now I'm 30 years old. I don't know what to do myself. Um, which is, it's kind of sad in a way that you, that we have uh, a lot of, well, not a lot, but a small percentage of our generation who did not plan for, for this. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I agree. And I, I can relate in uh, many aspects, honestly. Um, you, you really do have to be comfortable with the fact that your life could very well end at any given day. Um, one of, one of the first things we did when I got to flight school was, we filled out basically wills saying, you know, what's going to happen to our bodies and all, everything whenever we died. And, uh, like everybody does that before they deploy, but like, you know, it's, it's a very sobering experience. And then, um, how, how old were you? Maybe 22. So you're 22 when you signed your first will. Yeah. I was 22 when I filled out my first will. And, um, yeah. And it, actually my first will ended up leading to, uh, a, a big fight that, that kind of led to the end of my mar my first marriage actually. Um, <clears throat> cause you know, we, we all, we all fill these things out and, uh, like we had a, we had a crash, um, February 22nd, just a few months before we deployed and, uh, we lost several Marines and, um, you know, some, some of which we, you know, we hung out with every single weekend and, you know, drank with all that and with, with my wife there and, um, being able to like, after having the crash and realizing that any one of us could have interchangeably been in that helicopter, I, I don't know. It was a real wake up call. And, um, so, so it kind of, it kind of, kind of messes with your head whenever you actually have to accept it. And you, you just get so fuck you get so task focused and you get so focused on what you're doing as a job that you no longer are focused on anything outside of your, um, your military job. You're not focused on your regular life at all. And so whenever you get out of the military and, you know, you've escaped that, that, that death, that, that thing you've accepted, um, you've escaped this, this world that you, you've put yourself in, it's really hard adjusting back to a normal life and um, finding meaning in a normal life, honestly. Like if whenever you've been in a scenario where you've had, you know, people calling up and like, hey, you know, my, my buddy's shot, he's, he's going down and, you, you know, you're facing death, you know, face to face, you don't care at all. You're firing rounds down and like if you get shot down, so what? going back to like college and going out and getting a job in a cubicle, like it's, it's a hard adjustment. It's, it's something that psychologically, I don't think any of us are prepared to transition to normally. Um, some people do it better than others, but it, it definitely is something that kind of weighs on your mind and it gives you a, a perspective that most people only get whenever they're in their late sixties and they're actually facing death in the face. Um, so, so yeah, I'd say it's, it can be a good thing or a bad thing for people. And um, I think oftentimes it's a bad thing until people figure out how to relive their lives. And then they have this, you know, this freedom where they're not scared of death anymore. And they know how to live their lives. But um, you got to figure out how to rebuild that, that part of you again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in a couple of your articles you wrote about, I forget how exactly how you phrase it, but the, the why, like the, like, like yeah. kind of attributing to like, like what's your purpose? Yes. Um, can you talk about that? So when I, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I, I had recently, um, you know, we, I'd finished my deployment in late 2012 and I got out of the Marine Corps in late 2013. I'd also gotten divorced. I had also kind of lost my faith in the religion I was in. 
Um, I had kind of split with some friends I'd had and um, I didn't really have a whole lot of purpose in my life anymore. I, I didn't know what I wanted from life. Um, I didn't know, you know, necessarily who I was after all the experiences I'd had. And um, I, I just, I honestly didn't have much direction. Um, so, so getting out and um, becoming, becoming a normal person again, you have to rediscover your why. When in the Marine Corps, it's simple. It's like, I'm keeping my buddy to my left and my right alive. I'm keeping this guy on the ground alive who needs my help. Like it's, everything's very simple. It's very clear why you're doing everything you're doing. And then whenever you go out and you have to remake your own life, you have to discover your own why. It's no longer an externality of somebody who relies on you. It's, um, it's a force that you want to chase on your own. And it's, it's something like a new passion you have to discover in yourself. And a lot of us were so uh, emotionally and psychologically drained that it's hard to rediscover what it is that we care about, what it is that, that drives us, what it is that, that's a purpose within us when we've lived for a very large purpose with, with a lot of people that we loved, you know? And um, so rediscovering, you know, your big why, like why get up every morning? Why put in a, a, a day's work? Why go interact with people whenever you don't like people anymore because of, you know, whatever your experiences may be like. Um, and so I, I think that <clears throat> we really need to spend more time focusing on, um, you know, that, that, that why these motivations, these, these frameworks that you kind of take for granted up until you no longer have them. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's a big part of veteran reintegration that, that needs to be addressed and, uh, isn't, isn't enough because <clears throat> honestly it just sounds like pretty much anything that sounds emotional or psychological in any way sounds like, like, uh, for lack of better words, pussy shit, you know? Mm -hmm. And so Marines don't talk about it or, you know, veterans don't talk about it. But I, th I think it's very important that they do in order to get back on track in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting um, that you mentioned, like, you know, the only people you don't want to deal with that you don't like. Because in the Marine Corps, it's like, okay, if you don't like someone, you have a filter, right? Yeah. First filter is what's their rank? Yeah. If they're higher than you, you just you fucking deal <laughs> you with it. <laughs> if they're your same rank, you say, you can either say, screw you. Depends, depending on how soon you think they might get promoted, yeah. you might have a little bit of like, okay, well, this fucker <laughs> might, is going to get promoted before me. Um, and then if they're lower than you, then you can say fuck off. But when you're in a civilian world, <laughs> it's like there's so many gray areas and you have to be nice to everyone. And a lot of times, like you just wish things were more black and white because in a lot of ways, things are a lot more efficient. Uh, and can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. It, it Th that comes from, all right, so you go through high school and everything's very hierarchical and makes a lot of sense. And then you go to the Marine Corps and everything's very hierarchical and makes a lot of sense. And uh, in both cases, whenever you get mad at somebody or if somebody's annoying, you, you can just you can just trash them. Just come after them aggressively. And, um, you know, you don't, you don't put up with stupid people. You can just kind of push them out of your life or whatever. Um, you, you get in this, this is the real world, as you know, I was going to say the civilian world, but the real world. And you have to deal with people and you have to put on a smile and you have to do all these things where um, it's, it's hard, you know, especially like, all right, say, say for example, like I'm in real estate and um, every day you, you just got to go out. You have to have a smile on your face. You have to talk to people. You have to be very nice and accommodating and figure out what they need. And, you know, and if you're coming from a background where everything you've done is hyper aggressive and um, any kind of conflict you meet, you just meet with full on aggression or you just shut your mouth and do what you're told if they're higher rank. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's really hard to readjust into um, normal life. And uh, you, you have to, you have to build up a certain level of aggression, honestly, to, to be in the military, especially in combat related jobs and um, kind of trying to learn how to deprogram that and pull yourself out of that uh, super aggressive mindset, that super um, angry, disciplined, like here's how everything's gonna work in this unit because this is what needs to be, you know, keep everybody alive and to um, back to just the normal work life. It's, or just normal social life. It's very, it's very difficult. And then there's something to be said for shared experiences where if you've had a few very intense shared experiences with certain groups of people, you don't really relate to other people as much. Um, this happens in, you know, just about anything from, you know, from the military all the way into like the, um, you know, say the, the transvestite community, even like you, you, you deal with some very abnormal situations that other people can't relate to at all. And you don't really want to stay connected with people that don't understand you. And um, so learning, learning how to kind of pull yourself out and 
reintegrate back with a bunch of normal people and become normal again, it's extremely difficult. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to kind of shift gears again and and take us back to, um, Afghanistan. Uh, so you said that you, so you described to me, you know, the first time you shot at someone, um, time you thought you were closest to being fucked. Um, and I remember, um, we talked about this last time about how you described, you know, shooting someone at the first, for the first time. And, um, you know, the, it was an exhilarating feeling you're high-fiving and, um, and then you're expecting, I, I, I'm just interpreting what you wrote that you, you may have been expecting, uh, some sort of feeling to have or mm-hmm. something to define your experience. And it, and that kind of never came. Um, can you describe that? Right. So I, I was expecting, um, I guess uh, maybe a weight's the right word to describe or some kind of even elation, like something, you know, you, you watch somebody kill for the first time, say on TV, uh, say you're watching Dexter or something, you know, and like you see their face and you see this like, you know, either purpose or happiness or, you know, whatever the emotion may be. And then to like look in and um, the first time I shot, you know, we high five and stuff just because we saved the dude, the British guy, you know, like that was cool. And then we kind of, you know, left and it was just like, what should I feel about shooting somebody? And I felt absolutely nothing, like just nothing. It was just something I did to make sure this guy, this Brit could go home to his family. And it wasn't anything beyond that for me. And, and that, that kind of messed with me a little bit. Um, you start to wonder if, if you're normal, like, cause <clears throat> normal people shouldn't feel nothing at all when they've killed somebody for the first time or the X time, you know, like that shouldn't be something that you're hyper comfortable with that you don't, you know, that's just as benign as opening and shutting a fridge. Like that's, that's not how it should feel, but that's how it felt for me the first time. And, um, I, I mean, honestly, pretty much every time and trying, trying to like look at yourself and, and tell yourself that, you know, you're a normal person after experiencing feeling absolutely nothing over something that, you know, most people build up as this huge act is it's, uh, it, it's personally a little bit, it's, it's a little bit strange. It kind of shakes you a little. I was, uh, I was concerned for a while, you know, like am I, my psychopath, my sociopath, like what's wrong with me. And, um, then, you know, I, I realized, you know, like, no, I absolutely love certain people. I love, you know, animals. I love a lot of different things. Like I do care about a lot in my life, but, um, ultimately I was in a conflict where we had chosen sides and I felt like my side was on the right side morally. And when you feel morally justified doing something, uh, as we've seen throughout all of human history, you'd be surprised at what kind of things you can do without feeling a single hint of remorse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's very, it's almost very numb. Yeah. Yeah. Numb's, numb's definitely a good word to describe. Like, especially cause you're reaching in for some kind of emotions in you, you know, like pull them out. Like, no, no, this is a huge deal. This is a very complex thing I'm dealing with, you know, and I, I should be dealing with my head. And whenever you go and reach in and there's like, nah, I don't feel anything. Just a blank wall. It's a, it's a strange feeling coming to terms with. Um, I, I don't know how that relates as far as like ground side, if you guys have different experiences or not, but with, you know, with us in the air, given that distance that we have when you're just basically seeing little small stick figure people or you're just shooting at a bunch of trees like it feels very much like an abstract act that doesn't actually mean anything Mm -hmm. you're you're just trying to accomplish a goal you're just trying to get somebody home to their family because you know that hey i like i'm i think i'm on the right side of this this conflict morally and this you know this this marine this you know this army dude this this british dude you know whoever like they have a family to get home to I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get them back home to their family. And the killing is just like something that happens along the way of you trying to do that. 